you're one of those bands where it's like the gift that keeps on giving. Cool, but thanks. To change tax here, Terry, have you ever, be honest here, have you ever masturbated thinking about how many people have fucked to cherish? Yes. Did you reach completion every time? You mean today or yesterday? Yeah, exactly. In all seriousness, yes. when you wrote Cherish, and again, <laughs> I'm not blowing smoke, did you know that you had written a masterpiece? Did you know it was going to be a big hit? Or was it, I know you wrote it like in 10 minutes, right? I received it in 27. <laughs> Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on the association, along with our very special guests, the two founders of possibly the greatest soft pop act of all time, purveyors of such fine, fine hits as Along Comes Mary, Cherish, Windy, and Never My Love, Terry Kirkman and Jules Alexander from The Association in a five-part series called From an Unprecedented 13-Hour Interview. Look, if you know, then you know. But if you don't, then you ain't going nowhere. Because finally, here's your chance to stop embarrassing yourself around friends you give a shit about when the subject of The Association comes up. Just in case you don't know, tonight's band, The Association, is an American sunshine pop band from California. During the late 1960s, they had a bunch of huge hits at or near the top of the charts, including Windy, Cherish, Never My Love, and Along Comes Mary, and were the first band at 1967's Monterey Pop Festival, which really was the first rock festival of the modern era. In essence, they started it all. These guys paved the way for the softer sound of the 70s, yet oddly and very attractively to a nerd like me, they stopped committing to those very sounds at the turn of the decade. The Association is one of my favorite bands of all time. In the next hour, we'll learn about how these two guys wound up assembling one of the most successful acts of all time, the incredibly intense difficulties they experienced trying to sell a kind of music that hadn't yet even been invented, and then of course, exactly how many acid trips were indeed taken. Okay, first things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography is a music obsessive's dream come true. The guest and I explore an artist or band's entire discography in a futile but valiant attempt to reach a higher truth, which often is cleverly disguised as a nerdy compendium of star ratings and lists. The show is heavily researched, and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. We don't just cover albums. Uh Uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and sometimes bootlegs and live stuff. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between 0 and 5, which allows us all. The real reason we do this, the Tootsie Pop reward at the center of the rock and roll lolly, to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. Coming up, we've got Bob Nastanovich, Deer Tick, Corey Hansen from Wand rating his own discography, and Mike Watt rating the entirety of the Minutemen's output. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and subscribe. And away we go then with Terry Kirkman and Jules Alexander, not to mention a super secret surprise third guest as we ascend the marshmallowy, pillow soft contours of <laughs> Mount Association. A vocal blend so magical, they seem to exist in harmony with the winds that blew through the LA canyons, turned a six and seven man mind cocoon, ruptured by personalities bursting through, <laughs> fully formed from a shared bedrock of self effacing anonymity. All right, now for our guests. Self-effacing anonymity. Wow. I like that. Yeah. Right? 
Wow. Right? Because to get that blend, there needs to be a reductive capability there. All right. Now for our guests. And man, am I excited. Seriously. I mean, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Terry Kirkman was a salesman visiting Hawaii in 1962 when he met Jules Alexander, who was serving in the Navy at the time. The two kids promised to meet up when Alexander was discharged. That next year, back when people used to keep their promises, no matter how ludicrous, Kirkman moved to Los Angeles with Alexander and wound up playing with Frank fucking Zappa before Zappa formed the Mothers. The two then became members of a 13-piece band, the men. They disbanded in February 1965. Kirkman and five other members formed their own band, and they called it the Association. Lads and ladies out in the twilight reaches of Discograffitiville, would you please help me in welcoming Terry Kirkman and Jules Alexander? Woo! Applaud, applaud. Jumping up and down, dancing backwards and forwards. I am going to break through that cynical veneer if it kills me. <laughs> it fucking Don't kills hold me. your breath if you're listening. Hey, dear. Hi, Jules. How you doing, man? Oh, if I was any better, God would be jealous. Look at you, man. Here I am. Yeah. Look at you. When was the last time you guys were in the same room? Was it Oh, it's a year and a half or so. We played not far from Terry, so Terry and I got to hang out a bit. How many phone calls per year do you regale Terry with to try to get him back in the fuck? Band. Oh, that's forget Never, that. Not once. Not once. Really? Not once. Yeah. And Terry, were you regaling? I mean, I don't know how expensive it was to call India in 1967. It must have been a little bit pricey. But were you like, come on, get you got to get back here. We need you in this band. I'm not answering that question. <laughs> You can shut me down at every turn if you'd like. All right. So am I the only one that's going to rate the work? Do you think you can do that with objective distance? Well, the problem is that I wasn't on a lot of the stuff and Terry wasn't on some of the stuff. That's fine. So we can't, you know. That's okay. You know how you feel about it. That's all that matters. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Uh, can I say fuck? Hell yeah, you can. <laughs> Yeah, you can. In case anyone out there has been living under a rock <laughs> the last 50 years, the association is what I would deem a sunshine pop band from California. During the late 60s, they had numerous hits that were either at the very top of the Billboard charts or very, very close to the top. Windy, Cherish, Never My Love, and Along Comes Mary. And they were the leadoff band at 1967's Monterey Pop Festival. There's boatloads of intricate vocal harmonies by the band's multiple singers. And a very interesting point for me, the association paved the way for the soft 70s sounds. Yet when the 70s rolled around, you guys turn your back on your commitment to that style of music, which I'm very much looking forward to getting into talking about. Kind of known as uh, a singles band. To me, you guys are an ultimate albums band. My dad used to play you guys all the time. He's a greatest hits kind of guy. So I started there, but I broke through the surface of the creme brulee and got to the custard beneath. And man, am I excited to have done so. This is what I call a hot seat episode. I've only done this one other time where I have the actual guy from the band, in this case, guys from the band, who were trying to take a step back and look with as much objectivity as is possible at their own work. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm fucking tripping over myself in uh, abject excitability right now, thinking about the road just ahead. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of the catalog and of the history, I want to engage in a section that I affectionately call the run-up, which gets us to release number one in as quick a fashion as possible. Although, I'm going to take my time a little bit because I want to learn more about your backgrounds. Terry, if you want to start, I'd like to know more about your childhood. Pre-1962, pre-meeting Jules, did you grow up with stars in your eyes as far as the path you were going to be taking? Not at all. My mother was a really colossal pipe organist and piano teacher in the small farm town of Chino in Southern California, about five miles from where I live now. And uh, my dad had played in bands in Kansas, but I heard him play. Uh, he sometimes would sing. Uh, my brother, five and a half years old, and I was a, a bass player. Uh, the only instrument I ever learned how to play was sousaphone, tuba, 
the only instrument I ever learned to read music on. I started playing songs and instruments when I was three or four years old during World War II. A long time ago, folks. And that was on a marimba because my mom took me for the piano after we moved out here. And I taught myself how to play melodies on a saxophone, didn't learn how to read, and I never learned to play it right. And I was a failure as a music major in the first two years of a junior college here in the local area. And that was a great music school. Learned 20 piece orchestra, 60 voice choir. And uh, that's when I met Frank Zappa. That's when I played with Frank Zappa. And I was done with Frank Zappa long before 1962. So uh, Jules and I did not come back to be with Frank Zappa. He was off and running. For the past 40 years, Mike Stax's Ugly Things magazine has been bringing its readers in-depth stories about the greatest overlooked music of the 1960s and beyond. It's actually the longest-running independent rock and roll fanzine in the world. Ugly Things is now also a podcast. The Music Machine, Moby Grape, Love, Clear Light, Gabor Zabo, The Trogs, John's Children, The Velvet Underground, and more. All illuminated by exclusive interviews, conversations, and musical highlights. Like Discography, the Ugly Things takes you deep into the music and the lives of the people who made it. Most podcasts are only skin deep. Ugly Things cuts to the bone. The Ugly Things Podcast. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Jules, did you play with Frank as well? No, even though I lived within five miles of Terry and Frank at the same time, I, I didn't know them in those years. I, actually, I grew up in Tennessee in Chattanooga. My mom was divorced very early and remarried and moved out to California. My stepdad was a history teacher in Chino, as a matter of fact, at the high school. I didn't know them at all. I didn't meet Frank until, actually, uh, I met him with Terry one time, which is a story that Terry should tell. That was about it. That was my whole introduction to Frank. He was a good musician, and you know he was known around a little bit locally. One of the threads that I think is very interesting about your band. I feel like history has this way to more easily understand the world of attenuating the image, certainly of some bands. You guys, to me, at the outset, watching Monterey, watching your performance of The Machine, you guys are fucking weird. And, and I mean that in the best way possible. Here on Discography, we cherish and value the weird. But over time, the image of you guys was the perennial slow dances of, of America, but that's not the whole story there. So certainly kicking things off with Zappa, that's a, a, a what the fuck notion if people aren't familiar with that side of you guys. Did you guys see yourselves as freaks or as squares or as a combination? Because I know you had right wingers in the group. Eventually, there was a whole amalgam of different political leanings and philosophies in the group. Are you guys freaks or are you squares or what's the deal? Go ahead, dear. <laughs> Kick his well, ass. I was wondering if we should tell them how freaky it is, Jules. Uh, well, uh, sure. Fuck it. Basically, with everybody else, it was much like the mid-60s. If you were at the Troubadour on a Monday night, which was the Hoot Night, the Hoot Nanny Night, the Open Mic Night, the uh, Agent Promoted Showcase Night, etc. In the mid-60s, you were on Ground Zero, one of the most interesting gatherings of as-yet-unknown people that you were ever going to find. So if you if you got up on stage on a Monday night, you played, there were 25 people in the audience that were soon going to be droppable names. With the exception of guys like David Crosby and some people who had already been in the business with Crosby had been in the business with the Les Baxter Balladeer. Mm -hmm, Jerry mm -hmm. Esther had been in the business with the Les Baxter Balladeer. And Terry Collier. Yes. Well, lots of people. Everybody had been in the Christie Minstrels. Everybody. That's what commercial music was at that time. But in the mid-60s, folk music started to change and become a real American product of really interesting writing that didn't have much to do with uh, Appalachia or anything else like that. Stories and ideas were, were being formed. Most of the people in a Monday night crowd like that were small town kids. The Troubadour was a destination spot. Jules is from Chattanooga. When I met Jules, you were, what, 18 years old? And I was 22 years old or 21 mm -hmm. years old. Jim was in the Army. Ted was playing in some... Cherry Hill Singers. Yeah, the Cherry Hill Singers with the striped shirt. 
And you guys are arranging other acts, right? Didn't you act as directors and arrangers for other acts? Jules yeah. tonight. Yeah, we did. I was backing up Jackie and Gail, the two women in the Christy Minstrels who had left the Christy Minstrels and had formed the duo. They did some some records and stuff. I was playing behind them. Terry and I were, I don't know, I, I don't know how that worked, but we were, <laughs> somehow we were telling people what to play and sing. <laughs> I didn't have a clue. At this point, you were like, uh, and I'm guessing you still are because you're heading up the band. You were a self-contained Brian Wilson type. You had all the voices in your head and you would correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds from all the research I've done, like you were kind of the musical director. Well, actually, it, the musical direction in the band was basically from Terry and me and Jim Yester. That was where the band came from. A lot of it came from myself and Terry, though that's where the ideas came from musically. But that took a bit of while for that to happen. Because when the men were together, 13-person band. I'm dying to know what kind of material that was. Is it oh, it was absolute folk music. Let me tell you a story about that band. Doug Weston, who owned and ran the Troubadour, wanted to be an entrepreneur of music. And he was. He was one of the last, actually. Impresario, I would say. He got the idea for the men. And he said, hey, guys, and all these hoot nannies that Terry was talking about, there would be an incredible amount of people there. He said, we're going to form a band. And he said, come to the rehearsals. Okay, come to a, an audition this one weekend and almost everybody you know <laughs> from LA in the folk music scene showed up and Doug ended up getting 13 of us there was 13 it ended up being a 13 person band okay the only and, other people I know of who were in there was Doug Dillard Cass Elliott David Crosby any other people oh yeah uh, that the, was the inner tubes that was the Doug, inner tubes yeah Doug Dillard created the inner tubes yeah, Doug yeah, Dillard was, was uh, standing there. He's looking at the Monday Night Showcase, and he said, "Fuck this! This is all <laughs> plan. You know, this is not a hoot nanny. This is a fucking showcase." Yeah. And he went around, and he, and he came up to me. And he says, "I want you up the stage, and I want you singing." And Jules was with me, and he, I want you. And then he just went around, and then he went down and told the guy who was MC the thing. He says, "We're going to go on." The guy said, "What are you going to call it?" Doug said, "Why?" Just us, because since you have to have a name, and Doug said, the inner tubes. <laughs> that was good. The inner tubes went on for about eight, nine, ten weeks. Yeah, it and it was, was every a big Monday night. Raw because you could get on stage and sing. So people were up and they were down. And what it was, it was a second law. We had one guy, Tony Mafia, who was oh. like doorman, MC guy, a really great artist, and an older guy. And his brother, Bill, Bill Mafia, was sent as an emissary after an inner tube set by Doug and he said Doug wants to see if you want to make this a real deal and 13 guys showed up so none of the women that had been on stage were involved with that a bunch of 13 guys showed up how different was the music that the men was making from the association oh quite quite first of all it was not electric we were all acoustic until Harvey Gerst one of the guys in there He's a real good guitar player in the men. He said, hey, I'd, I'd like to bring my electric guitar. And I had one also. I said, yeah, me too. And Ted Blueshell and Brian Cole. Brian Cole played Upright Race and Mike Whalen was in there. He played bass. We had two basses. Ted Blueshell, he was like first chair drummer at college. He says, well, I got a set of drums. I swear to God, this was as silly as that, you know. And we said, okay, let's do that. And folk rock was born that fucking night. That was it, man. You know, we did it, and it killed. I mean, it was like people went, what? Yeah, because Mr. Tambourine Man came out the next year. You yeah, guys were yeah. doing this in 64. Dylan came to see us one night. We were playing, and we were doing our normal set, playing rock and roll, folk rock. And Weston comes up to us after we'd done the set, and he said, hey, Bob Dylan's in the audience, and he wants to play with you and talk with you guys. And we said, oh, fuck, yes, he was already, you know, he was a big star. And he came up. We were all just amazed because he was really cool at the time. And I said, here, play this, or play my electric. And he said, what are you going to play? I said, I'll get bass, because I can play bass also. There was a bass around. And we jammed. The entire men and Dylan jammed on rock and roll, and it's when I realized Dylan was a hardcore rock and roller. He knew every rock and roll song there was, could play it, could sing it. We all played. He was on his way to Hawaii and had stopped in and just happened to hear about us. <laughs> that was really a trip. But that's 
what happened? I don't know what the actual time lapse was between that evening and his debut of an electric guitar at Newport. It was within six months yeah. that he did that. Is everyone that wound up in the association, were they all in the men? And then you guys just slimmed down until... Yes, except for Jim Yester. Bob Page, uh, the original member, it wasn't working out for him and his wife. And so Jules and I saw Jim Yester at a, in Pasadena. Ice House, yeah. At the Ice House. Hey, Jules, are you still giving Yester shit about being the new guy? No, that's changed. <laughs> <laughs> we have a new, new guy. Jim was fresh out of the army. Right Rush smack out. A dab out of the army. Just out of curiosity, the men, was it a conscious slimming down so you could become a manageable group? Oh, it- no. It happened in one night. Oh, really? Yeah. Tell me about that night. What had happened is Doug Weston, who was the creator of the men and so on and so forth, it was his idea about the whole thing. He turned out to be crazier than dog shit, okay? And we were going to have a recording session. He got this wonderful studio that was a big movie recording studio, got all of us, and we said, oh, we're going to go record. So we go to this uh, session over there. This was um, a big room that had a walled off glass wall sound booth, and then the, the recording room was out there. We walk in. And there are concentric circles on the floor with masking tape. And there's one mic in the middle of it. And he had little marks in it. He said, okay, says, now, this is a five-pointed star. And you guys are going to stand, five of you are going to stand on the points of the star. And three are going to stand here and there. And you're all going to sing into the one mic. And the short guys are going to sing in front. And the basses are going to sing in back. And we're sitting there going, oh, (laughs) So we said, okay, we got it all set up and you can see the booth from where we are, you know, inside the glass cage. He didn't want any of us ejaculating before a show because it took too much energy out of the male body. Like a boxer. Yes. God. Like everybody's on the asset. Nobody was, but it was like it. <laughs> we, we were there looking in. I see Doug and the recording engineer in there just yelling at each other. The recording engineer was telling him, this is crazy. You can't record this way. He said, no, we're doing it. You know, blah, 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 blah. The last I remember is seeing Doug walk out with, with a train behind him, very huffy. We lost him as a manager that night. We said, we can't do this. So we were still playing at the Troubadour. And Terry met this guy. You When you met, oh, shit, I can't even think of his name. I'll think of it in a minute. He met the guy that who's an actor who saw us and really enjoyed us. He, he played Steve Canyon in his TV show. Terry told him what kind of problem we was having. And he was somewhat of a businessman. He said, you're looking for a manager, huh? I said, yeah. I said, how about I manage you for a while? We'll see what happens. He said, okay. So this guy became our manager. Hey, lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. And so if you're like me and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discography is an entirely listener supported show, and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Friday, a Monday wildcard episode, which is either a soul-bearing interview with that week's special guest, or an offshoot show like Queasy Listening and Rock Cousteau. And then on Wednesdays, there's the humdinger of them all, Discographies, the top 10. You got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded. No questions asked. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discography. He said, look, you guys, it's time to get a little more professional because you're just not professional enough. He said, I'm going to hire a music arranger for you and we're going to just do it. He had good ideas. He, he was an um, excellent actor and, and new stage stuff. He gets us this um, arranger, Ruby Raxon, and, and he told Ruby, put together something for us. We want to do something. And he said, OK. We went up to this hall. He's talking about Larchmont Hall. It's a second floor thing on Larchmont Boulevard to see what he got. So Ruby Raxon shows up with all this music. I mean, this thick and this, ooh, this is the real thing. You know, we're going to get there. He says, okay, here we go, guys. We're getting the piano. And he starts singing the song. He goes, we're told very often da, 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 to lift up our hearts. 
So no matter what da, 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 da. Terry and I were both going, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and it's, you know He was so, giving us Glee Club college. Yeah, Glee, Glee Club. Club. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so I said, hey, hold on, we gotta have a little meeting here for a second. We went in this other little room and we started having a talk about it. this is not what we want to do. And Ruby got pissed off because is it? Ruby, it's not this bad. It's just that's not where we're going. So Ruby takes off, and we're sitting there because some of the guys and the men wanted to do it. Some of the guys and the men didn't want to do it. And Terry and I were kind of on the same side. We're going, this is shit. This is fucked up. Terry, you can tell them, Terry. The guys who wanted to uh, go along with the program, those guys fell away from the men. And Oh, no. <laughs> we fell away from them. Terry walked out, and I'm sort of sitting there, and everybody else is sort of sitting there like that. I run out after Terry because that didn't do shit. He was my ride home. We started having a discussion right out there on the sidewalk saying, this is fucked. This is not going to work. The guys in the band that want to do this, there's us who don't want to do it. So we right there said, let's put this together. Let's put together a band, you know, where we'll be electric, we'll be what's going on, we'll do it. And I turned around, and here is the rest of the guys that wanted to do it with us right behind us. We didn't even know they were there. It's everyone. Yeah, yeah. Dean Fredericks. That's a guy's name. Our manager said, well, you want a manager? Well, shit, yes. You know, so bing. Then we went to Terry's apartment to put this together. We went to my apartment on Alfred Street, three doors from Melrose Place. 85 bucks a month for an apartment. That was expensive. And my uh, ex-wife, she's there as well. And we went there to commiserate. Like, what the fuck did we just do? We got up and walked out of something that we... The men was actually selling out in folk clubs, but we couldn't afford to keep it. I thought we were really good if we weren't going to make it professionally. We went back to my apartment, and I think it was uh, Brian who turned around and said, don't look now, but there's two bases, two tenors, and uh, two baritones sitting here. We're getting stoned, and we're drinking wine, and Judy, my fiance, is there. Somebody says... I wonder what we would call ourselves. And I don't know if you know the iconic running gag is the punchline and it's the aristocrats. Sure. They made a documentary out of it. A great documentary. Yeah. 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 So somebody said, let's call ourselves the aristocrats. <laughs> we almost did. <laughs> <laughs> then someone else, because we're all really into words, says, I wonder what aristocrats actually means. And Judy had been on a game show and she had won one of those etymological dictionaries that weighs mm -hmm. about 16 pounds and it was sitting on the floor in the living room and she lets look at it and she says, well, wait a minute, here's a word that fits you and the word was the association. A group of people gathered together for a common cause and that, that was it. And Dean Fredericks put up $25,000 to rent a house on Ardmore. Jules has a website under that name now for the association. Is this where the ice house comes into the picture? Uh, yeah. Okay. Hold your horses. Sorry. We'll get to the knowledge that you possess already, sir. You have, <laughs> you have more than I. I'm just trying to connect the dots. <laughs> well, no, we don't play in the ice house. The whole folk circuit of Southern California was our playground. We disappeared off the performance stage for eight or nine months. We rehearsed in the Ardmore house five days a week, eight hours a day, nonstop. When you start to rehearse, do you know the direction you're going to head in? No. It was no, creating no. it. I started writing about this recently. Unintentional art. You have a drive to make art, but you've got all these new toys. You, you know the gestalt? theory the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts yeah mm -hmm. put six brains together and new shit's gonna come up jules's stuff at that time i was enthralled by it because he was writing stuff that was so delightful 40 times here i go round again and five four everything was unintentional i i maybe written two songs in my whole life it wasn't a song right it wasn't even a performer i didn't play guitar i didn't play piano and you didn't think it was going to be a professional thing when you were younger i was a journalism major i'd been a music major with frank in college and a bunch of other guys i worked in a folk club called the mating place in upland right here where i live right now that was maybe the most successful live entertainment place for 25 miles i mean it became a real honest God destination on the folk circuit. So the We Five, mm -hmm. John Stewart, Mike Stewart. Which were pals. It was 1962, and then it was 1963, and then it was 64. Meeting place folded. I moved into Hollywood, and Jules got 
got out of the Navy. And everything for me was an accident. Mm -hmm. My entire life, all of my careers have been at the suggestion of someone else. Jules, I don't know this for sure, but I'm guessing you had an intentionality about you because... No, in, in fact, no? maybe less than him. Really? Less than Terry. Yeah, I just wanted to play. That was it. Pictures of you as a kid where you're sitting in trees playing guitar and... It looks yeah, that's in Pomona, by the way. That's in the, the mountain right above Pomona. That's up there with my high school friends. And that was my friend's guitar. Yeah, I... I no, and... I had no direction except to play music. That was it. That was my draw to Jules in Hawaii. Whip out his guitar and uh, shit would happen. We met at a party. That's how Terry and I met. I was playing guitar. He had a recorder. And he started playing that. And I said, what the fuck? You know, and it, it was as if we had played together for years. That was it. Yeah. That's the joy of being an improvisational musician. Mm -hmm. Where somebody says, let's make some music. You say, fine. I was at a Christmas party a few years ago that was most with psychiatrists. They had a little band and everybody was reading music. And I brought my recorder and I just started playing along with everything that they were playing. And one of the guys got really upset. He said, you learned all of this music before. And I said, no, 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 I'm just playing. He didn't get that people could just walk in and start making music together. That was Jules's gift to the folk world that he'd get up on stage before the men. He'd just get up with anybody and start playing. And people were very, very thrilled that he did it. Right around this time then, is it a residency at the Ice House? No, that was before a residency existed, actually. He would just hire people, you know, who, whoever was happening. Music, comedy. Yeah, Bob Stain. So uh, Russ was lighting director at the Ice House, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was a light man. Russ was the light man and he's colorblind. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Had your sound already cohered? Did you already know what the association was? Or did the association? No, no, no. So the Ice House is where it all came together? Along with the other clubs. That was a place to play. It came together at the Ardmore. You know, that's really where it came together. But, you know, it was the place to play and show. It came together over eight months. Yeah. So around this time. We're missing a big deal. When we were in the men, Jules and I had a frame of reference. At least I did. Jules humored me. <laughs> well, my frame of reference about how to take a song and have it evolve and hold the audience's attention because then we had 13 guys so you could get five guys just playing one note together like get the drive thing that was before the drums but the biggest influence on me and perhaps most of the other guys in the band was the modern folk quartet <sighs> the modern folk quartet where Jerry Esther had been, Henry Diltz, the famous photographer. Chip Douglas, Cyrus Farrier. Yeah, Cyrus. By the way, his two solo records are so good. It's like uh, if Fred Neal had made a few more records. Yes. Right. Well, that's all the same bill. I first heard them in Hawaii when I met Jules. They were brand new out of Punahou High School. There is a huge influence about Hawaii in the association. Terry, myself, Larry Rom. Yesters, good Lord, yeah, it's really strange. My great influence, when I hear music, I would hear Stan Kenton in those days. Mm -hmm. And there's one musical group that influenced the Beach Boys, influenced the modern folk quartet, influenced all sorts of people, and that was the Four Freshmen. Yep. And the Four Freshmen were designed as a vocal group. They designed themselves as the way that you would arrange for the trombone section in the Kenton band. There's an unintentional through line that goes through there. The night that we debuted the association, actually we debuted it at the Ice House, but the big debut was the first time we played at the Troubadour. And we got up there in our hot sack suits and we unloaded. And in that first set was Cherish, One Too Many Mornings, Maybe enter the young. Along comes Mary. Along comes Mary. 40 times, five songs, maybe six. In the middle of the set, the room is a rectangle. And usually, like when the men played there, we were at the center of the rectangle playing across the short side of the room. At that time, when we debuted the association, we were against the back alley walls. We had the whole length of the rectangle. While we're playing, I thought a fight had started. There was a ruckus at the back of the room, and that was the audience. We got through. We ran off the stage, right up the stairs of the dressing room. At the 
very top of the stairs are the fucking modern folk quartet standing looking down at us play. And Chip Douglas just turns around and he looked at me and said, you did it. It was one of the greatest peer acknowledgments for an effort, our group, the gestalt, that I could imagine us having. Because they had tried to turn that circle and they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. God, I forgot the math then. Well, you somehow chiseled the perfect membership out of that giant, unwieldy earlier. Yeah. Are there recordings that exist of inner tubes? No, men? there may oh. be something of the men. Is it true that before you guys crossed paths with Jubilee, that you had resistance getting a contract? <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> I got turned down mob, by everybody in town. What kind of comments did you get? Because you guys are a very commercial outfit. At the time, we weren't. Nobody knew what the fuck we were. I mean, you know, who are these guys? What are they doing? So in 65, though, hadn't uh, Mr. Tambourine Man already hit when you guys are looking for a contract or no? No. Okay. Tambourine Man came out after we were already happening. Well, uh, what I do is I chop every career up into phases. Yeah. So you guys cross paths with Jubilee. They issue a single of Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You, which was originally recorded by Joan Baez. And then, of course, Led Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah. Which Terry's writing acid rock in a few years. But his hard rock bona fides are set in place by 65. So this brings us to phase one, thickly woven fluffy blankets of wondrous harmony, 1965 to 68. Let me back up a second. The association, when we first started playing, we could sell out the Ice House. We could sell out the Troubadour in a week, six weeks in advance. We had a 20,000 member fan club. 20,000 kids over about an eight-month period of playing the clubs as the association with the same repertoire that the first album was. Yeah, that was before anything, any record was out there. That was just from playing. We could not get arrested. <laughs> we got turned down by every major record company in Los Angeles. And I think it was Capitol where we had all these suits in the booth listening to us audition in their studio. And we got through. And they came out and they said, this is really exciting. We know that you're tearing it up out there in the clubs. I don't know how to market this. Mm -hmm. That was it. But here's the point. It's a music that had never happened before. People just want to jump over that. You can't jump over that. Probably a thousand other acts that were just as good. I don't know that anybody could have been better, but they were passed on. Nobody knew how the fuck to market it. KFWB or KNPC in Los Angeles was one of the first AM stations to run five record sets. Like FM, we had a local disc jockey, Johnny Mac. Magnus, yeah. But one day out of spite, he plays three versions of Cherish, and he was not allowed to play the association. And he did that out of fuck you to the management of the radio station. But you really have to get it in your head if you love that period of music. Music had never been made before. Mm -hmm. It was not unlike first folk music couldn't get played. Okay, with regard to just the vocal element of it, how in the fuck... Did your band learn how to sing harmony like that? We were all in folk bands, and that's what you do in folk bands. Not everyone gets to that level of vocal blend. You have the Beach Boys, the Progenitors, of course, being the four freshmen, but yeah. the Beach Boys, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And then, of course, you have Everly Brothers. When you get guys who are related to each other. Oh, yeah. Family oh, bands. Wow. No. You know, Yester, uh, Jim, has been quoted as, as saying, basically, things started with Jules. He'd sit down, figure it out on, on the guitar, and say, okay, you sing this, you sing that, yes. and these guys would adapt it. Is that what... That's exactly what happened. But the thing is, about the sound, it's a crapshoot. Who knows, when you put a band together, whether they're going to sound good or bad. You don't know. You just put a band together, and some guy quits, and some woman comes in, or this or that or the other. That's it. We didn't plan that. You know, we just, we just started yeah. saying, okay. Well, this is the intriguing thing to me is, yeah, I'm trying to get a sense of, obviously, the two of you are very close. What about the other guys? Are these literally just associates, or are they close friends? Jules, you all Yeah, I was, just, I, was, I was just thinking, Terry and I were close because we had had a, a relationship before the band even started. We already went back three years, you know, two, three years. In a band, you get to be a family. The way the bands were then, I don't know so much anymore. Maybe it's so. The new bands, 
but you, you're going through all the same shit together, you know. So you you got to have the same thing you have in the family. You're going to have arguments, but you're going you're a family, you know. And then you're going to have wives. Yeah, <laughs> and then they're going to come into the family. You guys have a certain kind of a performance that you do. You're not just doing songs. You're doing skits and little bits. <laughs> this goes back to something you you mentioned earlier. You say we were weird. We actually weren't. That's the way folk music performance was. You go to a folk club, somebody would sing, and then they maybe do a little poetry, and we were doing a folk show on stage. That's what the bits were and the, all of this sort of stuff was. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really straight from folk music. To me, weird is terrific. The machine, when I showed my wife, you know, because I'm telling her for years now, I'm pontificating on the theory that you guys are actually a weird band. <laughs> really, because the machine, especially... Who's singing that? Is that Russ? I can't remember what the song. I remember doing the bit. This not the song. What the one? What's yeah, yeah. Brian. 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 When I want to show someone, hey, look, this band is not just cherish and never my love. These guys are fucking freaks. I showed them the machine at Wed Monterey. Huge mistake, in my opinion. What's that no. doing that song? You mean? Yeah. Well, nobody knew what a rock and roll festival was, and we were the cannon fodder out the oh, thing. We were, no, we'll get we're like there. the fucking sound check. We have two years to go. We'll we'll get there. All right. So, <laughs> 1965, the very first release by you guys, and very few people have actually heard it. You got Babe, I'm gonna leave you on the A side. Baby, can't you hear me call your name on the flip? And I want to tell you, and I'm not blowing smoke up your asses because if there's one thing that I'm known for on the show, it's total abject honesty. I think it's a great first single. I really do. Wow, well, um, thanks, man. And it's not, you know, your typical thing. You guys were shooting for something a little bit off from where you ended up. The second single, 40 times, Jules' song, and one, two, too many mornings. Our arrangement of one too many mornings is, is one of my favorite things that we ever sang. Hold on, we're getting there next. He gives me goosebumps. I think one too many mornings. I don't have to ask you guys to know what you were going for there. I'm guessing the idea was just to ram Mr. Tambourine Man success right up. No, no, (laughs) No, it was just to do the song. There was very little thought about that sort of thing. You're doing a Dylan song. Yeah, yeah. And and folk rock had just hit huge and validated everything you've been working for now. So I don't begrudge you that if that was even, you know, a kernel of the intention behind it. Not even a kernel. First with Babe, I'm going to leave you. It's moody and dusky and mournful. Some of these elements in the shape it came to play on this single didn't really carry over into later association. It's a brooding blues, and yet you still have that thick harmony blanket. But otherwise, aside from that, it couldn't be any farther from the band that I I wound up coming to know. And also that really portentous cello. Is it a cello? An electric upright bass. Upright Ampeg electric and, bass. And honestly, I think Baby Can't You Hear Me Call Your Name, the flip is even better. I'm guessing that that's you already, Terry, on recorder. Yes. It could possibly be my favorite recorder solo of yours, is the flip of your first single. The vocal arrangement has a vaguely dissonant kind of, uh, do you guys know Shadow is Breaking Over My Head by the left back? No, I don't know that one. So it's got like a gorgeous harmonic weave, but there's also a dissonant one note run beneath that almost gives it a Buddhist monk flavor to it. That's what reminds me of this. It's a really interesting road that kind of wasn't taken by you guys that I really wish you had explored further, more echo slathered and haunting than what you had come to do, but similarly sophisticated in just a slightly different way. So is this you guys or is this Wrecking Crew guys? No, it's us. Okay. These early tunes are not just of archival interest. A lot of times there's that build up to the mountain. You guys are already there. Obviously, because of all the time you put in at the clubs and, you know, in rooms behind closed doors, which we'll never hear. Major building blocks in the excellence of the band. The single, I give four and a quarter stars out of five. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. What do you guys give this one? Well, I think it was pretty good considering what we had. If we had a four track, boy, we would have been in hell, I'll tell you. <laughs> Is this two track? That was two. Beautiful, man. Even better. What do you give it out of five? Well, I, I have a real hard time with that because it was our first attempt, you know, first couple of attempts in the studio, and we didn't know what we were doing. For what we did, I thought we did all right. You know, we did good, but... Uh, Don't overthink it. Just throw a number Yeah, out. that's it. Three. You give it three? Yeah, yeah. How about you, Terry? Same ballpark. 
Three? If I'm going to judge, I mean, later on, when there was a lot more deliberation and a whole lot less evolution to where we were given 40 days to pick songs, finish writing songs, arranging, then having somebody else come in and do the arrangement for us, which we had astonishing arrangers, we couldn't do it. An entire album in 40 days. I was going to say, as an add-on, we're leaving out an important thing here. Clark Burroughs of the High Lows. Oh. Wait, isn't he the arranger by the time you get to Along Comes the Association? Or Yes. He's not on Clark- board yet on One Too Many Mornings and 40 Times? Yeah, he did One Too Many Mornings, I believe. Let's talk about Valiant for a second. So that'll get us into the High Lows, etc. So off the back of your first single, Valiant Records offered you guys a contract. The first First result being the One Too Many Morning single, which was produced by Valiant's owner, Barry Dvorzon, at Gold Star, right? Yeah. Your second single, One Too Many Mornings on the A side, 40 times on the flip, even better than the first single, just an amazing single, I think. Uh, So it was not a discussed thing to ride a sort of bird's carpet into the public eye. In other words, you guys have been working hard for a long time. Then folk rock, instead of being something where you're kicked out of somebody's office, everyone wants to sign birds. So was it a disgust thing? Like, we've been working hard. Let's try to get up to the next rung by doing a a Dylan thing and turning it into a folk rock. No, it was just, uh, ooh, let's do this. I like that sound. That's really where it came from. We were already doing the song. Yeah, we'd done it for a while. Valiant Records put an ad to taste it that they were looking to sign a group. We had been passed on by all these major things. The only company that didn't pass on us was fucking Motown, and they wanted to change our name and our look. I was at the same point with the association that I'd been with the men that I just really didn't think we could make it because we're running out of that $25,000. We hadn't had a week where everybody made $100. Right. We're selling clubs out and we can't make hundred dollars a piece. Thank God it's not 13 people anymore. <laughs> no. no, it's six guys and wives. Ironically, the audition is at the Troubadour. <laughs> Uh, we go in, I look at say, here's three fucking suits again. Billy Sherman with his sunglasses on. I feel like, you know, three mob guys. And we sang and they signed us. So then 40 times, is that you, Jules? The writing? Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite songs that we did. It's fucking great. I mean, first cool. of all, harmonica solo. Who's, who's on the harmonica? Is that you, Terry? Mm-hmm. Amazing. Uh, really good work there. You're kind of like the Brian Jones of the group. Hey, look, is that a sitar? Hey, I, I, give me 10 minutes. I'm going to go master it and then <laughs> lay down the most tasteful, eloquent iteration of whatever I could squeeze out of this fucking thing. Even though the recorder was the thing you became known for, you are the Brian Jones of the association. I love 40 times because it's more aggressive and strident than what you'd become much more well known for. And these roads not taken are super interesting to me because after a few albums of sort of keeping mainly within one wheelhouse, you go back to Roads Not Taken from 69 on. So for this single, it's I think it's even better. I give this four and a half stars. What song are you talking about now? The amazing rendition of One Too Many Mornings and Jules is hit out of the park 40 times. I'm comfortable with four and a half, five. Given what? the state of the art at the time, the state of the art of the equipment at the time. Are you going with four and a half or five? In that ballpark. Oh no, I'm gonna before we go to Jules, I gotta get you to commit. Four point seven five. I do three quarters and one quarter as well. Jules, sir, how do you rate your hard work here? I did pretty damn good at the time. I would go with that 4.75 also. It's pretty good. Dean Fredericks helps you get the Valiant deal, but then Dean turns the reins over to Pat Coleccio, who managed you guys until 74, right? Actually, Dean had a partner also, Joe Koistra, one of the nicest human beings you've ever ever met in your life. Yeah, because, I mean, Dean sued you guys, right? Yeah, uh, rightfully. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, yeah, I we, want, yeah, we dumped him. He just didn't know what to do. You know, he had a great ideas, but uh, we had a hit record and we were playing the Golden Bear for 500 bucks a week. We needed somebody that could take the band a little higher than that. It sounds like he was rightfully sacked. 
It's a yeah, big- yeah, I think he was. Okay, something huge is about to happen. Tell me how you cross paths with Tandon Elmer. I believe it's you, Jules, who yeah. were hired to play in a demo. Tandon wrote that song, and one of the guys called him and said, Hey, Jules, listen, we need a couple of musicians to play on this demo. So you want to do this? Hey, yeah, sure. I, I went down and played. And I heard the song, and I'd never heard anything like it before. And I said, listen, guys, I want the song for the association. And they said, okay. Because he didn't know what it was either. That's how we got Along Comes Mary. You know what's interesting about that song is it almost has a hip-hop feel to it. It's almost like rapping. Yeah, I know what you're saying. It's got something in there that's to head. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And the cadences yeah. of it. So here's another brick in the wall, as far as I'm concerned, with regard to the fact that you guys are not the slow dance band of all time, necessarily. Because your first big hit is a drug song, and you basically invented rapping <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was pretty quick yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not going to be easy for any vocalist to hit i'm guessing that you know yester's got to be on his toes when he performs that no he's got it down now he knows it. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah I'm sure he's but he fine. was he was sick last year and i had to sing the song a bunch and boy did i have to get it right that's really a tough tune i have a story We're in the middle of an album and Jim gets in a wreck on his motorcycle on the freeway and he's in the hospital and we have a gig at Dallas, Texas. And it's one of those gigs that you can't get rid of and it's sitting out there all by itself. So we have to jump on a plane and go to Dallas. But Jim is the first time that we're really missing a guy. So we're on the plane and everybody said, what are we going to do? And Jules says, I'll take Mary. We get to Dallas and we've got hours, maybe the gig is the next day. I don't remember. I have a problem. I don't know the words to Along Comes Mary. Let's call Brian. Brian knows the words to the fucking phone book. Okay. So we call Brian up and he goes, no sweat. Every time I think, fuck, I don't know the words either. No one in the band knew the words to Along Comes Mary except the guy that's in the hospital back in Hollywood. So Jules calls up Jim in the hospital. He writes the lyrics down, then he tapes the lyrics to his acoustic guitar so he can read them while he's playing. Leonard Bernstein thought that Along Comes Mary, from a musicology standpoint, was a breakthrough in Western music. He liked he it. He went nuts over that song. He had caved in on a special within a year, and he spent 20 minutes on that song. This is a number seven hit. This is your first real serious flush of success. I don't have to ask you what it felt like. I mean, I'm sure it was extremely exciting. Although, Terry, you seem like an unflappable sort of guy. Were you excited or were you just kind of like uh, waiting for the other shoe to drop? What was the vibe? You asked me that? I guess I'm kind of starting with you because you're really a Trojan horse of impenetrability. I can't remember what it is that we rap, but we wrapped the album. KRLA Los Angeles, Major Powerhouse Station out of Pasadena was going to play it. The song had been released. We wrapped the album. We played it at the island house and we all jump in our cars we stay up all night and drive to lake kachuma out by santa barbara just as a celebration it's done you know you I mean you finish an album's a huge deal i don't even mean the album i mean like with the one song all of a sudden you're everywhere hold on a second there's a point to this stay with me Okay. (laughs) As we're getting in the car in west la we picked up somebody's girlfriend and as she got in the car KRLA played the record. We we couldn't have been more than like an MGM movie. Right there, boom, right on the association takes off the morning after the album's release, and there is a long post very play on the radio. How did it feel? You, it's not like you guys were an overnight success. You guys have been slogging it out for a long time. Were you relieved, or was it stressful to figure out, like, okay, what's next then? How do we maintain this? No. Okay. All right, so... You guys are heading into the making of the record. The thing I'm most excited to talk about, because I know it's going to be a contentious conversation, and I'm really excited about that. I'm a huge Kurt Betcher fan. Oh, yeah. So I like his music. I know, from all accounts, difficult guy, because he's not the kind of producer that wants to capture what the band does best and get it live on tape. This guy wants to take you over and remake you in his image. So I'm guessing, at least, that there was a lot of that involved. What did Kurt give to the group, and in what ways did he get in the way of what the group was trying to accomplish? 
first when we were with him, it was as if he became a group member. I mean, man, it was so good to work with him. He was great. He heard what we were doing, and he would say, well, let's let's do this a little bit more this way. Say, oh, yeah, that works. You know, his first time with us was absolutely fantastic. I don't remember why we left him. Maybe that reason, but we were going to do another record with him somewhere along the line. At that time, I think the 24 track had come into being. He had a couple of songs. I don't know whether they're great songs or not, but do the track on it. You know, he would do the track, and we would do all the vocals. That's fine. No problem, because we trusted him. We know he's a good guy. But when I went over to talk to Kurt one time and said, well, okay, h- h- how many tracks we got open for the vocals? He said, two tracks. I said, Kurt, fuck you. This is a vocal band. You got 22 tracks of instruments and you got two tracks for the vocals. Adios. AMF. You know, that's and, it. And so began, you know, a producer lasting for one record with you guys. You use producers like, uh, you know, a sick guy uses Kleenex. Yeah. Yeah. Was that every producer that you worked almost, with? Almost, almost everyone, except John Boylan, really good producer. He worked with right. us. Yeah, yeah. That, that was great. Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson didn't care as fuck about what anybody else in his band thought. Mm-hmm. From what I understand, that later became a real albatross that did weigh on him because, you know, eventually the flights of fancy that he was taking, which history proves that he was really on the right track. But, you know, you had Mike Love constantly fucking up everything by saying, don't mess with the formula. Not a fan of him. I'm not either. I mean, the Beach Boys, it's like the story of Icarus, basically. The Millennium record that Kurt wound up doing, that's his great statement. Statement, I believe. But I know Terry has strong feelings about this. Jules, it seems like you're kind of both sides of the fence on Kurt's involvement. Terry, what's your feeling on Kurt and what he brought? That's a hard question for me because we didn't get along. Was he telling you what and how to sing? It just didn't click. Yeah. Someone suggested it was the difference in our size. Tiny guy, right? Um, yeah, Kurt's tiny. He's smaller yeah, yeah. than me. I didn't like being cowed by him. Mm-hmm. And all the guys in the group did not either. He had some adjustments to do in that regard. It just didn't work for me. He was not the only producer on this record, though, right? He did a few sessions, and then you guys finished up elsewhere. We've been playing that music on stage for at least a year. So there was a lot of stuff that he came in, and we needed outside ear to look at how it was going to go down on tape. Mm-hmm. But we didn't need anybody's help, really, in telling us how to do it. You know, some adjustments, that's where people like Clark Burles come in and they look and say, you know, you get the same effect if you just invert this chord that you're singing. All of a sudden, you get the same bang, but you're not shredding your voice for the next five days. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jerry Esther is a great arranger, and he shredded my voice all the time. I would go from uh, second bass to high second tenor in one thing and right back down to bass. The record is recorded in March 66, comes out in July 66. It goes to number five. It's the most successful record that you have released to date, except for your greatest hits record. And uh, we kick it off with Here They Come as a man in his 80s. When you look back on a song that is so much stamped in time as Enter the Young, do you remember who that guy was who sang the song in the studio that day? Do I remember me as the guy who sang that? Yes. Yeah, with some uh, embarrassment, yeah. What do you mean exactly? really no what I was doing as a performer. It didn't really settle into me until after I left the group in 1971, the first time. It really never settled into me until about eight years ago, 30 years outside the group, that everything I did was loud. My voice was loud. I hit the congas too hard. You think that is a blanket uh, across the board kind of thing? Yeah. I'm deciding that it has to do with ADHD. It has to do with manic it has to do with drugs. Uh-huh. It has to do with what was of- what was your drug of choice at that time? Then yeah, marijuana. Then. Had you done acid by the point at which you sang this song? I only did acid once in my whole life, except when I got spiked. Jules and I got spiked one night by Nancy Craig. Oh, Nancy Craig, Jesus! <laughs> when did you intentionally do LSD? The one experience you had with it. Or 1969. Well, not the first illusion that I did. 
and I've been hallucinating for a long time. Spiritually, leaving out a whole thing, the Beach Boys, the Mamas, the Papas, the Modern Folk Quartet, Steppenwolves. John Kay. John Kay. What about John Kay? We were all in a spiritual... Oh, Sabud, right? All of these records were tested on. Your Own Love, they were pushing that one hard. So getting to that, Your Own Love, and I want to say just as a whole, this record is just endlessly listenable. My wife and I both cannot get enough of this record. It we were forgotten though. What's that? Totally forgotten now. Not on anybody's playlist. Well, you're not hanging out with the same people I hang out with apparently. <laughs> For example, in the in the Facebook group, it's called Discography Soldiers of Sound. You guys come up constantly as a continuous point of reference. Maybe 200 or so yearbooks in college and high school use the whole lyric. It was used as the template for the yearbook. Yeah. They followed the lyric with the different activities in school. There is a choral thing for high school and college choirs called the Enter the Young Series that were animated. Anthemic. I really wanted to make more and more anthemic music, meaning it's an totally an anthem. This is an anthem. And there's also there's a strident fuck you thing to your voice, which is not part of Cherish, obviously. You know, so it's good to get that from you. And there's a lot of that that you have later on that you use. Oh, I have a fuck you voice. <laughs> yeah. But uh, then to move into Jules's work, Your Own Love is fantastic. Obviously, the guys at Sabood thought so as much because they were pushing that one hard. What I love about it is this is psych and it's tempered psych. So it's sort of bubbling under the surface. But this is psych at a time when it really wasn't happening that much. Revolver was in the general time period. But 66 is kind of early to be doing this kind of stuff. It's impressive. It, it's not like peaking on acid. It's like microdosing. Well, they didn't have anything to do with acid. Yeah, that was that was all uh, spirituality of that sort. That song came to me while I was opening a can of cream soft corn. And the first thing that I received that was uh, Beware the Young. <laughs> we, wow, that that's was, great. Then I went out the alley behind our apartment building and I thought, that's not going to fly. Be I, have, be I actually, I got to say, I like that better. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, that's freaky. So, Jules, this is a, I know it's a co write with Jim, but who wrote the lyric, Everything You Need You Have Inside You, All the Things You See Are Just to Guide You? I don't know. I think it was he and I both. We were probably discussing that because he was into Sabood. I wasn't into Sabood. Uh, I was in a whole different thing, sort of going towards all trees grow up, you know, that right, kind right. of grow in the same direction. That's a great song. And the guys in Sabood, they would feel out your songs, right? And then they, they were sort of your A and R team in a weird way, right? Did it pass the Subud taste test? Something like right, that. Right, right. You know? so that's a great one. Then then you got Don't Blame It On Me, an amazing earlier Adrisi Brothers effort. Not quite as transcendent as Never My Love, but how do you say his name again? Gijer? Jagir. Jagir, okay. Yeah, it starts with a soft G in the middle, a hard G in the middle. He's got this pleasing, but very left of center thing where it almost sounds like he's got a very suspicious and paranoid annoyed undertow to some of his vocals and definitely on don't blame it on me i feel that pretty hard he's hitting those syllables really hard sort of over enunciating as a style yeah that probably comes from stage singing you have to over enunciate that's one of the things we learned you know move your mouth to those lyrics you know it's a great song then you got blistered <laughs> billy ed wheeler which was later a hit for johnny cash mm -hmm. it feels like a seemingly intentional throwaway track even though i like the song because I think this is a super strong album. If anything had to go, if I was going to shorten it, it would be this. But it's there and gone in a, in a heartbeat. So yeah, that was a fun tune. I know exactly what you mean. It was just it was just a fun little tune. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, clever. Okay, musically, I liked it. That Brian singing. I thought that was Russ. Was, yeah, I got yeah, great bed blisters on my. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks <laughs> for like that, Joe. Please. Let's do the invitation of press singing the whole song. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I believe under the really beautiful introductory guitar figure, I think you can hear Russ clearing his throat. Which uh, uh, song is that? I'll, I'll Be Your Man. The Beach Boys used to do that all the time, leaving background chatter while a solo was going on or what have you. All that incidental stuff always adds to it. Gorgeous Russ vocal, terrific beatle ending, and just a really pretty Mamas and Papas style ballad. I love I'll Be Your Man. Not a bad one at all. So how close was Tandon Almer with you guys? He and I were acid partners. <laughs> it was funny. When we all lived at Ardmore, there was quite a bit of uh, softer drugs around. Hardly any Coke at all. I don't think Coke came in until much later, actually. All the semi-psychedelic drugs and stuff like that. And it was funny. He would show up with a bandana around his wrist, tied, you know, red bandana. I said, what's that for, man? I said, I suppose I cry so much because everything's so beautiful when I'm on acid. You know, he wipes it. Did you do a lot of acid? Not a whole lot. Finally, one time I took it and said, okay, I've been there. I've done that. Bingo. Yeah. It just that's it. That was the last time I took it. As soon as it hit, my thought was, I don't feel like doing this right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, okay, I know what's coming now. I know what's coming now. This is just every day, so I'm going to pass on it. Along Comes Mary is the recorder solo the only instance of an association band member playing on the debut? I don't know. Maybe Terry knows. I don't know. Is it all Wrecking Crew except for the recorder solo on Along Comes Mary? No, that's I played on almost everything. Mm -hmm. I was on that path okay. when the association started. So I said sort of in a different way at that point. That, but. That's what's so weird about, yeah, I can understand the guys stepping in for the monkeys, let's say. Still, mm -hmm. I love the monkeys, but I get why they would step in. You guys, super adept musicians that are then replaced. Yeah. What he does to cut an album. Yeah, it can't be done. Yeah. Right. What he does to cut an album. We expediency, lay the tracks down, give us something to work on because we have to learn the song while we're singing it. Once we were checking into a hotel in Chicago and Peggy Lee, one of my favorite American artists of all, was checking out. And we sat in the lobby together. And I do not remember the context in which she gave me the advice, but she turned to me and she said, I'll tell you something, sweetie. Don't ever record a song that you haven't sung for at least three months on the road. Oh, she was right. Wow. Jesus. That's like, really good advice. You don't know the song. Got to get those road chops in on. We had already recorded Requiem when we opened at Newport Book Festival. We had already recorded Requiem. We did not Requiem. And I've been very restrained for years from saying this, but I am comfortable with it now. Had we sung Requiem for the Masses at the Newport Folk Festival, or the Newport Rock Festival, Pop Festival, I think our career would have been totally different. Yeah. Mm. I like your career. I think we would have been perceived of in a whole different concept because what the association got stuck with was our airplay music. Right. But that's what gives you guys texture and makes you interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because as a fan, you don't know what you're in for when you take the deep dive with you. So for me, and for a lot of the people I know, you're one of those bands where it's like the gift that keeps on giving. Cool, but thanks. To change tax here... Terry, have you ever, be honest here, have you ever masturbated thinking about how many people have fucked to cherish? Yes. You have? Did you reach completion every time? You mean today or yesterday? Yeah, exactly. In all seriousness, <laughs> when you wrote Cherish, and again, <laughs> I'm not blowing smoke, did you know that you had written a masterpiece? Did you know it was going to be a big hit? Or was it, I know you wrote it like in 10 minutes, right? I received it in 27. Ruth Ann, who wrote Wendy, she told me that she said 22 minutes. Wait, was she there when you wrote it? No, yeah. I'm talking about her writing Wendy. And right, right. A lot of the greatest songs of all time pass through people. Did you, did this pass through you? Is that what happened? Or No. So when you're done writing Cherish, you're sitting there, you're just finishing up. Do you remember thinking, holy shit? Or did, you, did it feel like just another song? I wasn't a songwriter. That's maybe the third or fourth really complete song I ever wrote. It's, it's not like I'm Barry Mann, who's out of the Brill building, and that's what you do. You write fucking songs. Well, 
Look, I've been doing the show now for about a year and a half, and I've had some really like heavy hitters and blessed to have a lot of great guests. But I think it's safe to say, without even needing to sit down and think about it, that you have had the biggest hit of anyone who's ever been on. So how does it work when you write a song that becomes that big? Your relationship to it over time, what is that like? You know, Ruth Ann has obviously had a similar experience, but how do you feel about Cherish? Cherish was so unprofessionally done by me. The next morning I went in with a lyric sheet and I put it down with Jules and I sang it to Jules and Jules did what he does with his chords. And those chords set up the basis for the harmony, but it's a very hard song to sing. When the vocal cloud swells and overwhelms you in the last minute, that is pure magic, man. When I first heard it, I surprised Jules with this when I was writing for the Huffington Press. I heard it in the same kind context is Loving Feeling by Barry Mann and the Righteous Brothers. Then I sang it back to myself in my head. You get close to five minutes. No one in pop radio is going to play a song that goes over 245, 250 in those days. <clears throat> Thank God for Like a Rolling Stone, huh? Jules and Jim kind of took the song over because they were living together in uh, Ardmore and because I didn't play guitar and I wasn't playing the right chords, the, the melody and the Lurks stay intact, but in those days, I would just sit back and I'd say, well, let's see what anybody does with this. And for that, I will be always grateful. So when you hear that song these days, does it kick out any emotion in you? Is there no. a feeling that accompanies it, or is it just a numb? One too many mornings gives me goosebumps. What does Cherish feel like to you? What does it feel like as the guy you are today, not then? Lucky. Does it ever sweep you away when you listen to it, or is that, are those days done? I was very touched when I heard Jules and Jim's version of The Association two years ago. Probably close to tears. I owe Jules a lot for that song. But I tell you, singing that song, every night we sing it, it's amazing. Every time, every time, you know, and the, what you were talking about earlier toward that last minute when it rises. Yeah. It, it uh, goes from an F to a G. <laughs> it can bring tears to my eyes, absolutely. You know, a good song is not going anywhere, modulate. There you go. <laughs> it's a real accomplishment. And I know the music industry has changed a lot recently, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to have some kind of cash cow like that must be nice, at least while it lasts or, you know, however that works. So congrats on that, man. So we got Standing Still next, which, again, I want to stress, I do not feel you guys are a singles band. So to me, Standing Still is fantastic. Cherish is fantastic. It's all of a piece. Ted Blue Shell. <laughs> You know, what's very interesting to me is this six slash seven man mind cocoon where initially, you know, one of the great benefits of listening to music in a discographical fashion, you get the real sense of the arc of the band. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and early in the story of the band, you guys are writing, at least to me, in what feels like the same style as each other. As 1969 especially comes upon us, then you start to hear, holy shit, we're ping-ponging from this to that. We're doing jazz, soft pop. Then we're over here to Appalachian folk music. So it's incredible to watch you guys splinter like that. That process of that band unity, at least from that early stage, fragmenting is not a sorrowful thing. It's exciting. Yeah, we, we had better recording equipment, <laughs> which, which really helped that push it along. You know, when all of a sudden you got 48 tracks and then now my little funky computer here i have endless tracks you know yeah, but, so, it, but that doesn't write a great song no yeah. but what it does is allows you to experiment and put yeah. different things in you just could not do before okay so standing still by the way i love the solo in this the guitar is that mike dc maybe or yes is one of those in and out songs. Then comes Message of Our Love, which has got to be the crown jewel of your association with Kurt. That's, yeah, yeah. It's as far out as you guys ever got, I believe, is psychedelically speaking, and always has been one of my favorites. The oscillator work on that is fantastic. You may have only done acid once, but it sure doesn't fucking feel like it in this song. Totally hypnotic and amazing vocal as well, Terry. You know, everything on the song shimmers and ripples like a fever dream and then about two and a half minutes into the song when kurt's oscillator screw around start to zip into the <laughs> it's true psych territory like hard 
psych territory. Yeah. I, I wish that you guys had proceeded even deeper in that territory because it found full flower on birthday. But then in the depths of the part of my imagination where quantum mechanics is a real thing, I like to think that there's a record after birthday and before the self-titled one that is Bad shit, crazy psychedelia where some of the song constrictions start to fall away a little bit more. But regardless, again, if I want to show people, no, these guys are freaks. Message of our love. So the next track, round again, only a minute, 50 <laughs> seconds. You guys are doing six, eight time while referring to it in the lyrics, which is so awesome. <laughs> love that shit. Okay, so more recorder. Terry, are you thinking at this point that you've got a side gig waiting for you outside the band as resident recorder guy? We didn't know what we were doing. It was just, hey, I have a piece of wood. I'll let me blow in it. By the way, that was six, eight and five, four also. There's a couple of five, nice. four bars in there. Nice. Those it's my favorite time signature now in my head. Another great, great aspect of this record is that Jules hijacks it for the last three songs. So what was the thinking <laughs> coming out of what you guys refer to as hangings? Whoever gets designated, their songs get picked. Was there any kind of thought process behind those three working together? That's the record company. Oh, they really? Put, yeah, that, at that time, the record company was telling us what's going to be on the record and in what order it's going to go. We almost had nothing to do with that. We had nothing to do with that, actually. Jim would refer to it as hangings. As your career went on, it would get closer and closer to coming to blows. Yeah, well, that would be in picking the material. Right. That wouldn't be in putting them on the record. That's record company stuff. I think that the issues around picking the material gets to be, well, you're pressured. You don't have the time to even think about it. When we ended our time with Warner Brothers and Columbia bought the contract and we didn't get all that much money. We got $100,000 a lot more than it is now, but it was not a million dollars or anything like that. And we hadn't had a hit in two or three years. I begged Pat Coleccio, and then asked the group if we could hang it up for three months, six months, and go run a house like we did on Ardmore, maybe in the Monterey Peninsula, and just take a breath and be creative again. We were working 250 days a year. Yeah. You don't have time for anything. It sounds almost not enjoyable. When I left the band after the first Columbia record, I went home and I couldn't function for seven or eight months. I built myself a studio. I never unpacked the boxes. You're talking about brains that are just cooked. And then somebody asks you to come in, okay, be selective and go to the cookie cutter. I wonder how much of that contributed, Jules, to you just, you know, pulling a split ski. 99% of it. We start falling apart. We, we start resenting each other. Yeah. There was a change point, and I just want to say that you can leave it in at this point or not, but Jules and I just had a conversation, and I don't want to speak for him. One of my biggest regrets has nothing to do with the value of the person as a professional performer or singer or anything like that. But one of my biggest regrets was that I was the one that asked Larry to join the group hmm. because Larry was not in the mindset of what the original association was at all. A whole different energy, a whole different music that he loved. He had an actual voice. He had an actual style. And he, he had to break great songs too man oh yeah i'm not talking about the value of what he did i'm talking oh, i understand about. what you mean the recipe just got altered so larry feels like he tipped the scales so that the public perception of the group was the square was the slow dance for all eternity without the machine without message of our love without the fucked up undercurrents that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. make it interesting mm -hmm. i'm saying that not in a way to devalue what he brought not at all you know just look at it's got to be real that song is amazing both versions are amazing in their own ways you know musically he brings a lot to the table but i get uh, warner brothers wouldn't touch it because it didn't sound like the association <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it so true it didn't but well, at that point you guys didn't sound like the association no mm -hmm. matter Mm -hmm. And that was the point. So, okay, Jules, you got three songs in a row there. You got Round Again, yeah. Ember, and Changes. Yeah. You talked about Round Again. Remember, sung by Yester, to me sounding very doo-wop influenced, but with some really fucked up trippiness percolating beneath it. A really amazing song. So what are your thoughts about those songs? Do you see a guy who was gravitating towards leaving the country? No, that, well, 
leaving the country was a, a this much, you know, uh, in into the whole thing, you know. But okay, th- there were three separate kinds of tunes. They're really different from each other. Changes is the, to me is the most interesting one because the way that you sing it is so conversational. It's like you're just hanging out with a friend and talking to them. Well, I'll tell you, Ruth Ann, she's the one that uh, I was impressed by her songwriting, and I, I wrote something that might be kind of something like the stuff she would write. Oh, that's interesting. Know. Check it out. Have you told her that? Or no. No? I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> no. That's pretty cool. I'm sure she'd love to hear that. Okay, we're at the end of that record. But first, I want to tell you, I have a pet peeve, which actually I think is a, has a negative connotation. So what I mean, I guess, is I have this thing, which is that there's a compendium of terrific lyrics that happen before guitar solos. Where line is one of the greats. Sometimes words don't make it, so I'll play. Yeah. Wah! Ah, thank you. <laughs> Great song. This album is one of my favorite records of the 60s. Cool. Only one song, Blistered, is not a classic to me. Yes. Everything else is perfectly in its place. You guys set the bar so ridiculously high for yourselves. <laughs> so I want to say thank you and I'm sorry. <laughs> It's a lot to live up to, man. Really- oh, dude, yeah, yeah, this is a great interview. This is really fun. I got to tell Thanks. you. That's a hard five stars for me. Okay. What do you give this record? Oh, yeah. I would give that a five. Yeah, I would give it a five. Terry, how about you? I would give it a five in Dayglo. It was not just the quality of the record, but its place in being an identifiable new voice. We didn't sound like anybody else. We didn't sound like anybody else except for maybe where Kurt Betcher put the theremin in and he wanted to be Brian Wilson. Mm -hmm. Right. He tried to replicate you guys with Sagittarius. No, he wanted the Brian Wilson thing. And that was perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or doing anything. The thing that impressed me about the album is that 90% of it was wholly original. That you went back and said, wow, what is that? Some years after that album, Leonard Bernstein was celebrating a birthday, probably a 60th birthday, and he was in an interview, and whoever was interviewing him said, you played a major role in like a four or five different decades. And when they get to the 60s and they said, that was a big creative revolution. Bernstein surprised the interviewer by saying, I don't know how creative it was. What happened was that people started taking one music and putting it together with another music. And that evolved. He said, I don't think there were many groups in the 60s that really, truly created. And the interviewer was really taken back. And he says, wow, well, who in your opinion was? And he said, the Beatles and the Association. <laughs> and when I was told that, I sat back and I said, thank you. Thank you, because it was an accident. Mm -hmm. We weren't trying to sound like anybody. But most works of greatness are. Mm. I'm 83 years old now, and I've been in a lot of different kind of creative pursuits. And how many records do you sell hasn't got almost anything to do with your art? Mm -hmm. Your art is your art, and it stands alone. Correct me if I'm wrong, but your Uh cell phone pictures are on the same democratized level of creative importance to you as Cherish, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I love them, too. I I think they're incredible. To this day, I have very few conversations with anybody about the value of the association because it always wants to dress it up and kowtow to a bad hit and this and that. And I thought, yeah, that was, but that's not what the recipe is. Yeah. You're not talking about these wonderful songs like 40 times. I've told Jules over and over again. It's one of my favorite songs. Let's talk about the two outtakes. There's Better Times and The Machine. Maybe there were more, but these are the two documented outtakes that I know of. And Better Times feels like your first intentional step forward into the sunshine, as it were. Like, you know, the burgeoning Don't sun. Don't use that word. What's that? Don't use that word with me. Sunshine. Which, Please. Uh, Which better- word, Jerry? Uh, sunshine. I, I, I hate that put on us by the English, the British. We were not a sunshine band by any stretch of the imagination. Well, what I was getting at is that Better Times feels like Kurt put such a heavy stamp on it. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that, that was Kurt's whole thing. Better Times feels like the ballroom. Yeah. One of his other acts. That, I'm guessing, is why it remains an outtake. 
No, that, that's how it feels to me. I don't remember what you're talking about. I don't, the song I don't in Kurt's right. tune, Better Times Than Well, Let's Go Do Better Times Than Happy Places. It was oh. absolute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I've heard <laughs> everything by Kurt. And this sounds like one of the random anonymous bands. It sounds like a Kurt band, in other words. All right. So these two outtakes, I give four and a half stars. Better times, I give one. Oh, really? You hate it? Yeah. It's not that I hate it. I just, nope. Nope. I'm counting the machine though. With the machine is something. No, the machine. Well, that's a kind of hard to rate because it's its own thing. I don't know how to judge it against anything else. Because that's it, why I give it four and a half. Okay, yeah, I, I yeah, can, yeah. I can do that. Yeah, me too. Are you talking about the association machine? Yeah, I hated that. Like, <laughs> well, hey. <laughs> Oh, right. I thought I was going to vomit with Monterey. Don't get ahead of ourselves. Jules is tired for crying out loud. Yeah. I don't want to proceed any farther except to say that the next record is Renaissance. Uh, that, that's where we'll pick up. Let's end it here then. Okay. This is great. I love what you're doing here, man. This is and really fun. Listen, you guys are going to own the show for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> I'm serious. Whatever it winds up being, it's, it's four episodes, five. Oh, God. I want it to be comprehensive. I love you, Jules. Guys. Me to you. I love you both as <laughs> well. And David, I like you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good enough for me. Okay. All right. That about does it. A heartfelt discography to thanks goes out to my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Terry Kirkman and Jules Alexander, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the soldiers of sound. I love every last one of you. And this show would not exist without you, my friends. Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, Discography soldiers of sound that's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show but there's a hell of a lot more you get recaps of the day in music history the ability to pitch questions to guests polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator and much more so make sure you don't miss out you can find the link to the discography soldiers of sound facebook page right there in the show notes and if you don't mess with the zuck i get it just email me at info at discograffiti.com and I'll keep you in the loop. So now that it's done and you want more, another way to dive even deeper into the magical sounds of creamy 1960s gold is to visit episode one of this series, episode 109, Vashti Bunyan, episodes 103 and 104, Burt Summer, 83 and 84, David Crosby, 77 and 78, The Zombies with Lou Barlow, numbers 59 and 60, The Monkees, episodes 22 and 23, and part one of the Bee Gees, when they were all treacly and hadn't yet found out that they were disco kings and that the universe preferred their chests bare. That's episode number 10. I want to also say that for the first time in the show's history, since Patreon began, for the next four weeks, we are not doing Monday and Wednesday shows. And the reason for that is these episodes for the association are very long. They run from an hour and a half to two and a half hours. Some of our shows are 30, 40 minutes. Initially, what I was planning on doing was cutting out all the many digressions and doing a big Patreon thing of, you know, all the, not outtakes, but stuff that didn't wind up in the episode. And then I just decided at a certain point that the whole idea of this series was its length, was its marathon type of feel to it. So I made it as close to a marathon as possible and then just decided no alternate shows, no nothing. This is this is the thing. And believe me, you'll be getting your listening value out of this series. However, do make sure that you visit patreon.com slash discograffiti and check out the thematically related deep dive as a music obsessive's way of life. Our Patreon's been up and running for a year, and with two episodes a week, there are close to 100 Patreon episodes at this point. That's an entire universe available to you for the price of a cup of coffee a week. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars because next Friday, September 8th, we're coming at you with the Association Part 2. The next installment's just shy of two hours long and there are some serious bombs dropped. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss it. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography. Discography.